Hi, we're Team Tropus. We're from an NGO called Rimba. My name's Shima. And I'm Mary Ruth. Uh, we started a project called Project Tropus. Tropus is actually the genus name, um, the scientific name of a group of giant fruit bats. They're actually some of the largest bats in the world. <laughs> really big. <laughs> And uh, we're interested in fruit bats because, first of all, they're, they're very highly endangered here in Malaysia. Um, but at the same time, they're also really, really important because they're pollinators and they're seed dispersers. Mm -hmm. So we actually need these giant fruit bats to help maintain um, all our natural ecosystems here in Malaysia. We need them to maintain healthy rainforests and mangroves. And um, you're probably <laughs> wondering why we're on Lindsay's page. Yeah. Because flying foxes and um, other fruit bats uh, pollinate durian. So without bats, you wouldn't have healthy durian. That's right. <laughs> so we're working with Lindsay because we're really interested in investigating more um, uh, on the pollination role of giant fruit bats and finding out how important these bats really are for the durian industry. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's a very, very strong relationship between fruit bats and durian. Uh, one of the interesting things we found out is whenever we talk to local people and ask them where are the giant fruit bats, a lot of people would say, well, you won't see them around here anymore except when it's durian flowering season. Mm -hmm. So they always say, whenever you want to see the giant fruit bats come, you wait for the durian trees to flower mm -hmm. and then they'll come. So they're, they're pretty um, important to each other. They have this mutualistic relationship. Um, and it seems that if there aren't fruit bats around, then durian trees are not going to be doing as well as they are right now. So it's actually really important to conserve fruit bats if we also want to maintain durian trees um, and a healthy durian industry. Well, there's been research done in Thailand that found that uh, there's a certain species of wild honeybee that's found here. Um, it's uh, called the Asian giant honeybee. It's a very, very large honeybee. It lives in rainforests. It lives. Uh, it makes its uh, hive at the, the tops of the very, very tall tualang trees in the rainforest. Um, this giant honeybee can play a small role in helping to pollinate durian trees, um, especially maybe some of the the cultivars that have smaller flowers. So, if there are no bats around, potentially um, giant honeybees might also be pollinating durian trees. But what the research also found is that these bees are just not as efficient as the bats. So they don't do as good a job um, at pollinating durian flowers compared to the bats. So even if they're still doing the job, you may find that without bats, there may be less durians. What about hand pollination? Um, hand pollination? <laughs> as far as we know from, yeah. our, from our interviews with durian farmers in Malaysia, we don't know anyone who actually does hand pollination. For one, um, the durian flowers, uh, durian trees are, are, can be really tall trees and the flowers at the top of the canopy would require a lot of skill to climb safely and it takes a lot of time to pollinate durian flowers, uh, pollinate anything in general. So the bats are actually really doing the humans a really great favour by mm -hmm. pollinating durian. Yeah, and, and when we ask farmers about hand pollination, they all seem to think that it's crazy, like yeah, who would want yeah, to do cool. that? Yeah. Um, but I've heard of a place in Thailand where they've had complete pollination failure because there are no more bats in the area and so mm -hmm. that's what the farmers have had to do mm -hmm. to keep producing durians. They've actually had to start hand pollinating their trees. Yeah. So we, we, we really don't want to see that happening in Malaysia. So basically we're trying, the message we're trying to say yeah. is that bats are doing you a favour by doing this work. I mean, well, by drinking delicious honey in the process, mm -hmm. but they're helping us make durian and Unfortunately, because they come out at night or people are just not watching, they don't know that bats are doing this. So it's, it's important for us to raise awareness about this and basically spread the news that if you love durian, you have to thank the bats. That's right. The, mo the most common questions I usually get about bats are negative questions. So usually yeah. people just want to know how can they get rid of bats from inside their house yeah. or they're worried about what kind of diseases they can catch from bats. So it's also um, part of our job to teach people that bats are not dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, bats are actually quite safe to coexist with. Um, if you don't um, intrude into their habitat, then they won't intrude into yours. And they're actually doing you um, a service. And there are a lot of benefits that we get from bats. Mm. And, and fruit bats are essentially vegetarian or they're fruititarians. Um, they they are afraid of humans, so unless you go near them, they're never going to come near you. 
Um, and one thing that we're also working on is um, looking at the symbolism um, of bats um, in Asia. So um, we find that not a lot of people know this as well, but it's um, traditionally in Chinese culture, bats have been seen uh, as a symbol of luck and blessing. Uh, because the, the name Pian Fu, Fu is a homonym for blessing in Chinese as well. And so we've been trying to dig out more narratives in, in Southeast Asia as well to see how bats are perceived. And a lot of them are not related to Halloween or witches or, or darkness or demons. So it's actually a really positive thing. And this is something that we're also trying to um, Bring get back. out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we know that in places like North America, people um, can catch rabies from bats, but that has not been the case here in, uh, in Asia so far. There have been no cases of bats trans transmitting rabies to people here in Asia. Um, there are cases where bats have transmitted diseases to domestic animals, and then those diseases have then jumped, jumped to humans. But again, it happened because humans started clearing bat habitat and then this brought the bats closer into contact with um, industrial agriculture, um, passed on the disease to domestic animals. And so it really goes to show that um, a lot of wildlife will not encroach into our spaces until we start encroaching into their spaces. If you don't come into physical contact with a bat, um, if you don't actually touch a bat, if you don't actually um, get close to a bat roost, there's a very low chance of you actually catching a disease from a bat. Where do bats live when they're not pollinating durian? Uh, it depends on the kind of bat. So like the, the teropus bats, the giant fruit bats, they tend to roost in trees. Uh, you'll find them in, uh, on a lot of islands, but you'll also find them in swamps, um, in mangrove areas. Um, and then the little cave nectar bats, they also pollinate durian flowers and they always roost in large caves. So you'll find a lot of those bats in limestone areas. Well, from what we know here in Malaysia, for sure, cave nectar bats pollinate durian, uh, large flying foxes pollinate durian, and also island flying foxes pollinate durian. But we're not sure yet whether there might be more bat species out there that also pollinate. Why do you focus on the giant fruit bats? Well, the giant fruit bats are the most endangered group of bats in Malaysia. Uh, they are fast disappearing across the country uh, because historically they have been targeted by hunters. So people used to like hunting these bats. Um, they were highly sought after as a delicacy and people also believed that their meat had medicinal properties. And because they were so heavily hunted um, and persecuted because people also believe that they're very damaging to fruit crops, um, they're now increasingly rare in Malaysia and they're very, very difficult to find now. And that might have knock-on effects for our ecosystems, maybe even for our durian, but we just don't know until we start investigating. But thankfully now, um flying foxes are under the totally protected um, species list. So it's illegal to hunt island or large flying foxes in Malaysia. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So if farmers want to be a part of your project, what can they do? <laughs> Come talk to us. <laughs> yeah, um, oh. well, we are, we are carrying out a survey across West Malaysia, talking to durian farmers, asking them, asking them about their perceptions uh, of pollinators, um, and, and what goes on in the, the reproductive biology. So, I mean, we would be more than happy if durian farmers reached out to us and wanted to find out more or just have a chat. Yeah, we would yeah, welcome we, that, yeah. Yeah, we, we hope to work uh, together with fruit farmers as partners. Uh, we, we know that fruit farmers have a lot of knowledge that we can learn from. Um, we'd like to learn more about what are the experiences of fruit farming in this country? Uh, what are some of the issues that fruit farmers face? And see how we could potentially work together to carry out more research uh, into things like durian pollination and also into things like sustainable agriculture and responsible farming. If anyone would like to participate in our projects and help out with our work, feel free to get in touch with us. You can find us at rimbaresearch.org.